Nobody had ever reigned over such a huge territory and then died at such a young age. So his death and burial are among the most important events from anywhere in the ancient world. The likes of Perdiccas, Ptolemy, and they want to succeed Alexander the Great. They want to be like him. They want to be really, really powerful. And they now see those generals who they'd once served alongside as potential obstacles. Perhaps more people have looked for the tomb and the body than have looked for just about any other so-called missing monument in Egypt. This two-year stalemate where nobody knows what's going to happen. And this sparks one of the most remarkable, if not the most remarkable, heist in the whole of history. So in early 323 BC, Alexander the Great, he's 32 years old, and he's forged one of the largest empires the world had yet seen, stretching from Greece to the Indus River Valley. He ruled over a territory which in total was probably greater than any ruler anywhere in ancient history had, had ruled. He had come to conquer Greece, of course, Anatolia, Egypt, the Near East, and he'd ventured into India, not entirely successfully, but nonetheless he had conquered some territory there too. And at the point of his death, he had returned to Babylon. He was in the palace of Nebuchadnezzar II there, reigning over as great an empire as had ever existed. It's really interesting in early to mid 323 BC, the last days, the last week or so of Alexander's life. We have various accounts of what happens to Alexander during this time, but there's an interesting account that survives in a couple of our sources from the royal journals. And it really starts with this event. Alexander, it's the evening of Sunday, and he's invited by one of his companions to a drinking party, the drinking party of Medius of Larissa. Alexander, he goes to the drinking party, he has a good time, he then goes back home, he goes to sleep, and the next day he develops a fever. And over the next few days, this fever gets worse and worse and worse, and ultimately he's consigned to his bed in the royal palace. Alexander then becomes mute, and he can't do any more issuing of instructions, issuing of sacrifices, anything like that. He's really near death's door. At this time, you had the soldiers of Alexander the Great. They burst into the chamber. They demand to see Alexander. Alexander famously, the soldiers file past him. He gives the nod. He gives a, a, a wave or something, this mute acknowledgement of their presence. There have been many theories put forward as to how Alexander died or what was the cause of his death. There have been theories about disease, about malaria, about typhoid. But you've also got to remember that Alexander suffered several severe wounds during his campaigns. He was smashed in the head and the neck by a catapult bolt. He was also punctured in the lung by an arrow when campaigning in India. So perhaps part of the reason for his early death was caused by all of these wounds catching up on him, perhaps combined with his heavy drinking. There might also be an element of grief in there too. Alexander the previous year had lost his closest companion, his lover Hephaestion. There is an alternative version of events in which something he drank, um, some dodgy wine um, perhaps, led to him uh, suffering uh, for a few days, eventually in agony, and this leads to his death. The suspicion in that case is that he was poisoned. This was put forward by one particular family many years later, aiming to demonize a rival, a hostile faction. And what better way to do it than to say, hey, you murdered Alexander the Great. But the idea that he was poisoned is almost certainly not true. In any case, he seems to have been suffering from, uh, from something for a number of days. And ultimately, on the 11th of June, with some debate whether it's the 10th or the 11th, I'm more swayed by that it was the 11th of June. In the late afternoon, early evening, Alexander, he's surrounded by his seven most important subordinates and he breathes his last. Alexander the Great is dead at the age of 32. At the time of his death, there was no clear heir to his empire, which meant there was a great question about who was going to take over, whether there would be a single person to take over all of his territories or whether they would become divided. And there were a number of candidates. Two of the most important of these 
are Perdiccas and Ptolemy. When Alexander dies, Perdiccas is Alexander's highest ranking subordinate in Babylon. He's Alexander's second in command. So much authority does Perdiccas have when Alexander dies that there's a story, and I believe it is true, that a couple of days before Alexander dies, he's mute at this time, but he does a very significant action because he hands Perdiccas his signet ring. Of all of his bodyguards there, he hands it to Perdiccas. Now, this wasn't to say, Perdiccas, I'm naming you my successor, but it was to say, Perdiccas, you're the most important figure in the army in Babylon. It is your responsibility. It is your job to oversee the succession of my empire. Ptolemy, on the other hand, was at his side at the time Alexander marched through the desert in Egypt, one of the most perilous, potentially treacherous journeys that he made in his entire campaign. So both of them has a claim to being very close to Alexander, um, very much a part of the inner circle. They're both very capable military leaders in their own right. They are both, therefore, very good candidates to take over. But because Alexander's done this action where he's given Perdiccas his signet ring, I think he's made it very clear that Perdiccas holds more authority than Ptolemy in the immediate aftermath of Alexander the Great's death. And this sparks animosity between Perdiccas and Ptolemy very quickly. So not long after Alexander the Great's death, there is a settlement reached in Babylon and Ptolemy receives Egypt, a very, very strategic and important posting. Perdiccas is named as regent. Now this nominally means because Perdiccas is regent, that Ptolemy is subordinate to Perdiccas. He ultimately is inferior to Perdiccas's command. But Ptolemy makes it very clear from early on when he's governor of Egypt that he has no intention of listening to any of Perdiccas's orders or abiding by Perdiccas's authority. He expands his control, he assassinates his number two, who was more friendly to Perdiccas, shall we say, and he starts building up his forces. So straight away, between 323 and 321, the animosity between Perdiccas and Ptolemy in Egypt only deepens. Alexander dies in Babylon and his body remains there ultimately for two years. It is very curious that the way that Alexander's body is treated after his death does seem to be heavily influenced by the Egyptian way of doing things. Um, his body is essentially embalmed, it's mummified, it's, it's preserved in the way that the Egyptian bodies had been treated and been mummified um, for centuries. It's also then placed inside what we're told is a hammered gold kind of coffin, which again very much recalls an Egyptian way of doing things. It's certainly not the Macedonian tradition of cremating um, the body. And it's very interesting to think that of all the places that Alexander conquered, all the places that he has an influence in, it would be Egypt that apparently influences this crucial phase of his life and his story, his death and burial. He did visit Egypt, of course. We know that he was very impressed, particularly by the Egyptian people's devotion to their gods, their piety. So perhaps it isn't such a great surprise that Egypt should apparently be so influential, especially when we consider what's going to happen to the body um, when it eventually does move and it does find a more permanent home. Now you need to remember Alexander, as soon as he dies, Perdiccas and many of the other generals, many of the soldiers, they consider Alexander basically divine. And so Perdiccas, he spends lavishly on what is going to carry Alexander the Great's body to its eventual destination. And this is a creation unlike any other. It takes two years to complete, but it's basically this huge, incredible looking funeral cart. Adorned with precious materials of all kinds. It appears to have been a sort of um, kind of classical building in its own right. And they get the best craftsmen from across the empire, the best wheelsmiths to help create this incredible ancient mausoleum. There are very elaborate descriptions of this in the classical sources and clearly it was a very very important part of the preparations. So this is the description of the funeral carriage which survives in Diodorus, probably originally from someone like Hieronymus of Cardia, an eyewitness of the carriage. And he begins his description with this. The carriage was built to reflect Alexander's glory. They started by making a casket of hammered gold the right size to accommodate the body. 
and they filled the inside of it with aromatics which had the property of both imparting a sweet smell to the corpse and preserving it. Over the casket was draped a magnificent piece of purple cloth, embroidered with gold, beside which they placed the dead man's weapons. Their intention was that the overall appearance should reflect what he had accomplished in his lifetime. Next, they brought up the carriage that was to transport this casket. It was topped by a golden vault, the surface of which was studded with precious stones. On top of the vault, in the middle of the roof, exposed to the open air, there was a stylized palm tree bearing a large golden olive wreath, which shone with a bright and scintillating light when struck by the sun's rays, so that from a long way off, it looked like a flash of lightning. The carriage had four shafts, and each shaft had four rows of yokes, with four mules harnessed to each yoke, making a total of 64 mules. Each mule wore a golden crown, golden bells hung down either cheek, and around their necks were collars studded with precious stones. We're not exactly sure when, but it's been estimated roughly around August, September 321 BC. The funeral carriage sets off from Babylon, and not on its own, you have the escort commanded by Aridaeus, the Macedonian commander. The funeral carriage makes its way westwards towards the eastern Mediterranean. And we're told that as it approached every village, they could hear it coming. All these bells, which were on the, the mule, also on the funeral carriage themselves, would announce the visit, the arrival of Alexander's funeral carriage far in advance, but also the glistening, the glinting of all of the gold. And we're told that villages just emptied. They emptied because people went onto the streets because they wanted to get a glimpse of this funeral carriage. So this funeral carriage, unlike anything anyone would have seen before, it amazes all who laid eyes upon it. It's not entirely clear where Alexander's body was intended to, to be going at the point it left Babylon. We are told by certain sources that Alexander himself had expressed a wish to be buried with the Oracle of Ammon in the Siwa oasis in the Western Desert in Egypt. This had been where Alexander had been declared the son of Zeus Ammon many, many years earlier. But Perdiccas has no intention of the body going to Siwa because who is the closest Macedonian official to Alexander's body if it goes to Siwa? Whose territory has it got to pass? His arch rival, Ptolemy's. It's his worst nightmare if it falls into Ptolemy's hands. Now, Perdiccas, he wants to now have control of the funeral carriage. He wants it with his royal army in Pisidia because he wants to take the funeral carriage back to the ancestral homelands of Macedonia and bury it with the other royal kings of Macedon. Perdiccas hopes by doing that, he will become really Alexander's true successor. He's also received an offer of marriage from Alexander the Great's only full sister, Cleopatra. So he'd return to Macedonia as probably as the husband of Alexander's sister, greeted by Alexander's mother, in control of the half-brother of Alexander the Great, in control of the son of Alexander the Great. Just think of that all combined with Perdiccas burying Alexander's body at the royal tombs at Agai at Fergina. He'd be unstoppable. He'd be unbeatable. He would be the clear successor. By contrast with Perdiccas, Ptolemy has quite different intentions. He, we understand, was not interested in taking over Alexander's empire in its entirety. He wanted to focus on Egypt and the surrounding territories, which he wanted to claim for himself. One of the reasons for um, his particular closeness to Alexander is connected with Alexander's time in Egypt. So perhaps it was at this point that Ptolemy decided, you know, this is the territory for him. If he can be the person who uh, takes final responsibility for the burial, then he puts himself in pole position as the inheritor of at least a part of Alexander's empire. And if he can make that burial in Egypt, then that gives Egypt a very particular significance in the whole story of Alexander and the succession and also his own story. That would, in short, secure for him, for Ptolemy, the territory that he is after. So Ptolemy, his main aim 
in 321 BC is to make sure that the funeral carriage, that Alexander the Great's body, does not reach central Anatolia, central Turkey. In many ways, he has no choice because he knows if he gets there, Perdiccas will become too powerful and it would only be a matter of time before Perdiccas turned on him and evicted him probably by the spear from control of Egypt. So although he may have originally agreed that they would bury the body at Siwa, Perdiccas has no intention of it going that way. But Ptolemy has predicted this many, many months in advance. Ptolemy has been colluding with key figures in Babylon, particularly Aridaeus, the man in charge of the escort, that regardless of what orders Perdiccas sends, that he's going to take the body at first, probably to Siwa, but ultimately it's going to go through Egypt. Unknown to Perdiccas, when he sends these new orders to Aridaeus, little does he know that Aridaeus is already in cahoots with Ptolemy about taking the body to Egypt no matter what. And this sparks one of the most remarkable, if not the most remarkable, heist in the whole of history. So imagine you're in Perdiccas' shoes at this time. You've sent those new orders to Babylon, to Aridaeus, to say, hey, you're not going to take the body any longer to the south of the Mediterranean. You're not going to take it to Siwa. It's definitely not going past Egypt. You're going to take it to me in central Turkey. Imagine the shock when he later hears that as Aridaeus has approached Syria, he has changed course. Rather than continuing west, he's turned south and is currently now progressing through Syria. Imagine the panic the anger of Perdiccas hearing that this funeral carriage is edging its way very, very closely towards Egypt. Now, this funeral carriage, even with the best suspension, this is a mini temple on wheels, really. It's not going to be going very fast. So Perdiccas, although he's hundreds of miles to the west, he reacts quickly. He gathers a small force, light armed force of some of his key subordinates, sons of a figure called Andromenes. They're called Attilus and Polymon. And they lead a, a rescue, a retrieval force, as it were, and they hurry at full sprint through Anatolia, across the Taurus Mountains, and down through Syria to catch up with this funeral carriage and make sure that they turn it around and it heads towards Anatolia. So they go past the Taurus Mountains, they go past Damascus, and they reach the funeral carriage. But they're greeted by a very, very bad sign, because by that time, Ptolemy once again has predicted the move. Rather than waiting for the funeral carriage to reach Egypt, Ptolemy has gathered a large army, well, a sizable mercenary army probably, and he's headed up towards Syria. He's greeted the funeral carriage when it reached the city of Damascus. According to the sources, they say that Ptolemy arrived with his army to give the funeral carriage the military welcome it deserved for housing the body of such an incredible conqueror. In reality, it was probably just to protect his winnings from Perdiccas' counterattack, and this is what it does. They reach the carriage, but they are unable to gain control of it because it has been substantially reinforced by Ptolemy's new army. They give up and they run back to Perdiccas in central Turkey to let him know, we failed. The body, the funeral carriage, is currently on its way to Egypt. You're gonna to have to deal with this. This is a huge blow. We know that Ptolemy is intending to take the funerary procession to Egypt. Um, ultimately, he takes it um, to Memphis. There are a number of reasons why he might have chosen Memphis to do this. It is the capital city of Egypt. It was also fortified. And that's important because Ptolemy was probably anticipating um, that he would he would face some resistance. In other words, Perdiccas would eventually catch up with him, which he almost did. Interestingly enough, we now never hear of this incredible funeral carriage again, because it really emphasizes how, yes, as amazing as this funeral carriage was, with all this gold, with all the time and effort put into it, the real treasure was the body itself. Even at the point at which Ptolemy had arrived in Memphis, he wasn't safe. And indeed, we know that Perdiccas did chase Ptolemy into Egypt. Ptolemy, by doing this, has taken the keystone, ripped it out of Perdiccas's plan for his own imperial ambitions to return to Macedonia to bury the body of Alexander the Great. To Perdiccas, he needs to react, and he's going to react. He's going 
to Egypt straight away. Ptolemy needs to be dealt with. So Perdiccas arrived in the northeastern part of the country, at the city of um, Pelusium. They reach Pelusium, the gateway to Egypt, in the easternmost branch of the Nile Delta. At a point at which one of the branches of the Nile um, disperses into uh, the ocean, only to find that there was a fortified garrison there opposing him, so he needed to journey up this branch of the Nile to try and find another crossing point. He tried to get across the river in the region of another city called Tanis, but again found he was opposed. He eventually made his way all the way to Memphis to try to cross there. So right opposite Memphis, if you look at the map, particularly the ancient maps, there's a large island. So here he decides he's going to cross, he's going to get to Memphis, he's going to get the body. Great. But it all goes horribly wrong. Perdiccas begins the crossing. It's deeper, it's a faster flowing current here. So to sort the issue, he puts elephants, his elephants upriver to slow the current to make it easier to cross. And this works really well for the start. So about 2,000 to 3,000 of his Macedonian soldiers, his veterans, his key troops get across to the island. What they don't know is what's happening underwater because the elephants are moving the soil as they're trampling around upriver, the soil is being displaced, the river it gets deeper, the current gets faster, and soon enough, the crossing is no longer a crossing. It's too fast flowing, it's too dangerous. So he's now got this nightmare situation. Part of his army is on the island, part of it is back with him on the eastern bank. And then he sees another problem because he sees Ptolemy's army approaching. And so he does this catastrophic decision. He orders his soldiers on the island to swim back. They oblige, they go into the fast flowing current and thousands, maybe as many as 2,000 drown. A thousand of which have the worst fate of all because they are sent down river. They are eaten by crocodiles. Perdiccas's forces, by this time, having made a very long and arduous journey um, from Babylon to Egypt, were beginning to get demoralised. Perdiccas eventually wasn't able to keep his troops heavy enough to um, stop them from killing him. And the commanders under Perdiccas, they decide enough is enough. They go to his tent and they assassinate him. So they did Ptolemy's work for him in the end. And that is the end of Perdiccas. Now that the threat from Perdiccas has finally been neutralised, Perdiccas is out of the picture, Ptolemy can now concentrate on burying the body of Alexander. Ptolemy, having defeated Perdiccas, the body is almost now his spear one possession alongside the whole province, alongside the whole region of Egypt. And so there's no demand for the body to be handed over. It is now with Ptolemy in Egypt. And what's interesting there, there's not even a demand that the body be sent on to Siwa, to the Oracle of Zeusamon at Siwa. It's just going to stay in Egypt, in Ptolemy's possession. It also means that Egypt is going to occupy a very, very important position in Alexander's story and then the whole myth of Alexander and his empire from this point onwards. The sources suggest that the body is buried in Memphis. Most probably it was buried at somewhere like Saqqara. There was a sudden great um, interest in this particular part of the cemetery in perhaps the early Ptolemaic period. Why would there be a sudden flurry of building activity in an area which is a cemetery connected to Memphis at the time of Alexander's death or there or thereabouts in the area of the Serapium, could it be that it's because this is where Alexander's body was buried? We can't know this, but um, that is as, as good as it gets in terms of archaeological evidence. And it's really interesting here, an incredible part of the story, which I believe, it is debated, but I believe. You will see in the British Museum today that there is an empty sarcophagus of Nectanebo II. Nectanebo II was the last native Egyptian ruler of Egypt. He was evicted by the Persians where he fled into exile in around 342 BC, so roughly 20 years earlier than the events we're talking about now, but he died in exile. But they create their sarcophagi in advance of their death. So this empty sarcophagus was just lying there in Memphis. And Ptolemy, he's one for seeing opportunities. He thinks now, if I put Alexander's body 
in the empty sarcophagus of Nectar Nebo II. Well, that helps spring roots new stories, which do eventually emerge, of Alexander actually being the son of Nectar Nebo II, and so Alexander having this direct link to the last native pharaoh, which will ultimately help consolidate Ptolemy's rule over this incredibly important, incredibly historic land in the southeast Mediterranean. And what's really intriguing about this is that by the time it was observed by European travellers in modern times, the local folk story around this, the local sort of myth, was that it was the tomb of Alexander. Um, once it was clear this was the sarcophagus of Nectanebo, that story that it was the tomb of Alexander, of course, was, was rejected. But actually, this mythical connection between Nectanebo and Alexander makes it not entirely impossible that that sarcophagus could have been at Memphis at the time Ptolemy was looking for a suitably grand monument, including a sarcophagus, to bury the king in. And that perhaps the body, even if it was only temporarily, was laying to rest in that sarcophagus. The events of Perdiccas and Ptolemy, this is really the start of one of the most tumultuous periods in ancient history, which is the wars of the successors. Some people describe it as antiquity's Game of Thrones. But basically, as these, war, these wars are going on elsewhere in the empire, Ptolemy stays in Egypt. And it's over 20 years later, like at the start of the third century BC, that Ptolemy moves Alexander's body from Memphis to his new capital, Alexandria. The likeliest story, I think, is that the body was, was temporarily in Memphis. It was moved to Alexandria it was for a time in a tomb devoted entirely to Alexander until the time of Ptolemy IV, at which point this new mausoleum built to house a number of kings was built. If that's right, we have to assume that Alexander was buried effectively three times in different places in Egypt, once in Memphis and then twice in Alexandria. The best um, descriptions we have of any of these tombs relates to this mausoleum, the third of the three, the mausoleum built by Ptolemy IV. It was the kind of monument that was visitable, so it wasn't hidden, it wasn't sealed. The bodies were on display. We also know that it was possible to go and see Alexander's body um, as well, and that this seems to have been the main focal point of this. We are also told that this mausoleum was within the palace's district within Alexandria. Unfortunately, not enough of the archaeology of Ptolemaic Alexandria survives for us to be really clear about which building was where. And it's never been possible to identify a single scrap of evidence of the mausoleum itself. It may be, even today, that some parts of it have survived and are buried deep beneath probably a very, very busy highway running along the coast in Alexandria. But until we invent new uh, techniques to allow us to see beneath concrete and tarmac, um, we have no trace of this tomb. There are many theories as to what happened to Alexander the Great's body. Probably the most plausible is we hear at that time it's really the rise of Christianity. And we know that many early Christian groups did sometimes physically torch down, destroy pagan sites. And you've got to remember, Alexander's tomb, it was also a religious place. It was a place of pagan pilgrimage. So it makes sense that Alexander's tomb was also destroyed when the Christians destroyed the Serapeum in the late 4th century AD. There's one other possibility that actually Christians sometimes destroyed pagan buildings but they also sometimes converted them into churches. So it may well be that Alexander's tomb was converted into a church. There's a theory by Andrew Chug that it became the Church of St. Mark. And there's a famous story that the body of St. Mark was later smuggled out of Alexandria by Venetian traders, and it is today in the center of Venice, very much on display. Could that body be that of Alexander the Great? Who knows, possibly. Whenever there is a spectacular discovery of um, a tomb or a funerary monument in Alexandria, it's more or less always the first question. 
people ask is, you know, could it be something to do with Alexander the Great? So two or three years ago, we had the discovery of a, a monumental sarcophagus um, underneath a block of flats, which had just been demolished and the foundations were being relayed. Um, it was indeed a previously unknown monumental sarcophagus of the late period or early Ptolemaic. So it was exactly the kind of thing you would be looking for. And it was sealed as well. The lid of the sarcophagus was lifted up and it was turned, it turned out to contain three bodies and a lot of sewage. Um, certainly not the tomb of Alexander the Great, but it just goes to show that people are still so excited at the possibility that it could be found that it's the first thing everybody wants to know. Is it the tomb of Alexander the Great? And it never has been so far. Well, I can't think of too many projects, uh, potential archaeological projects in Egypt that I would rather be involved in if uh, if the funding were there and um, and the opportunity was, was there to see beneath the streets. Um, there is no doubt in my mind that there is a lot of Ptolemaic Alexandria still underneath the modern city. Whether or not the tomb of Alexandria is going to be there, I don't know. It would be worth risking, you know, a, a lot, if you like, for the possibility of finding that tomb. How special an occurrence is it that a corpse is fought over, this incredible time, this incredible story? There are some really interesting examples and parallels in history where we see these figures who are considered great men, particularly by their contemporaries, where their bodies following their death are just as important to the people who surround them as the person themselves when they were alive. And a key example here, I believe, is the figure of Napoleon. He died on St. Helena, but on a later date, his body was taken back to France and the tomb you can now see in the centre of France. And it's really this emphasis how these figures can be just as important dead as they were alive. I think the story of Alexander's death and burial speaks very much to the unprecedented importance and influence that he had in his time. Nobody had ever reigned over such a huge territory and then died at such a young age. You can think of parallels from elsewhere where there would probably have been greater clarity about who was going to take over, whereas there is just none uh, at the time of Alexander's death. Hence this two-year stalemate where nobody knows what's going to happen. And the death and burial, the how and the where and the who, is absolutely crucial to what's going to happen to Alexander's empire. And that is absolutely crucial to what's going to happen in what was the whole of the known world at that time for generations to come. So his death and burial are among the most important events from anywhere in the ancient world. Thanks for watching this video on the History Hit YouTube channel. You can subscribe right here to make sure you don't miss any of our great films that are coming out. Or if you are a true history fan, check out our special dedicated history channel, historyhit.tv. You're going to love it.